Hello everyone. Um, well, I don't think there's much more to say about my past, but I do want to actually go into and talk a little bit uh, about, I guess, some of my journey, what's actually shaped some of my beliefs and why I'm so passionate about transforming schools, and in particular, globalisation of schools. So how we have internationalised Norwood Moriata High School, even more so over the past six years. Um, I'm really delighted to be able to be here and obviously share this with you all and I hope that you've got some really in interesting questions for me at the very end. Um, I wanted to just start off by saying, as you would all know, that we really, we live in an interconnected, diverse and changing world. We know that already. But this is really exciting, yet complex times and environments and they present many new and exciting opportunities for us all. However, it also presents cha challenges and, of course, we also know that it, rep it presents and offers rising inequities. Young people today, as far as we believe at Norwood Moriata High School, must not only learn to participate in a more interconnected world, but also to appreciate and benefit from cultural differences so that they're able to meet the cha challenges and changes of this changing world, but also, of course, humanity's challenges. Developing a global and intercultural outlook should be all of our work. It is a lifelong process, but it's shaped through education and, of course, personal experiences. This is something that you, I hope that you'll pick up throughout this piece today, that I'm really passionate about our work. It should be everybody's moral purpose about how we are preparing global citizens for the future. At Norwood Moriata High School, our vision is to um, is for all of our students to graduate as engaged global citizens. We talk about how we prepare them with the skills, the abilities and the capabilities to be able to actually meet the challenges um, of tomorrow, to be the innovators of the future, but most importantly, to be able to enrich humanity and make a difference. We talk a lot about thinking globally, knowing what's happening around the world, being able to appreciate and benefit from the uh, intercultural understandings and different cultural, different, uh, cultural differences, but most importantly, be able to internalise that, challenge ourselves and make a difference locally. So act locally. Um, it really fits beautifully with our motto, enriching humanity. I think that when I think about innovation, which is what I've been asked to talk about today, and I'm going to talk about it from a perspective of how we have changed Norwood Moriata High School, and we're transforming it. We're only part way through that journey. But you would all know that research shows that schools that have been really highly successful are those who've got a culture of innovation. It's an atmosphere that supports teachers or all staff to be able to innovate and come up with new opportunities within a really safe and supportive place that's supports productive failure, but also encourages people to have a voice and to be involved. And that's something that we try to do. I must admit that my role has probably been at times coming up with ideas around creativity, but I certainly, be, uh, and I think creativity is really important, but it's about what we do with creativity and how we implement that and make a difference for our young people at the centre of everything that we do. What we do is exactly what you would be doing at your schools, but always through a global lens and making sure that it's aligned to our vision and our values and our work that will shape global citizens. We want our students to be really well balanced now we, through our curriculum, through our co-curricular opportunities, but also, of course, be able to actually have a really strong voice. And uh, there's a lot of work that be has been uh, done. I do need to say that I am not an expert. I don't profess to be an expert. I want today to be an opportunity for you to ask questions and, and also to hear from, um, and I do have a couple of leaders in the room that I'm sure they'll be able to respond to and also agree that we are not experts. We do take a lot of time to reflect. We take a lot of time to demonstrate that we are agile leaders and responsive to our staff and our community. It's really important. And I'm going to talk also a little bit about vulnerability that I believe that as a leader it's important to, and there's a place to be able to show vulnerability. You don't have to be that strong person and know all of the answers, but to be able to build your teams and to actually collaborate and share your experiences, but harness their experiences and then their ability. So building ca capacity. I really love this. I think that we all know what Einstein has actually said in the past, and it's so true. In schools, we do need to actually innovate to make sure that we're not only thinking about future for our young people, but also making sure that change is not for change's sake. There is a reason, and it's always about improving opportunities and experiences for our students and ultimately their outcomes. 
Today I want to actually talk to you all about, um, first of all I'll give you a little bit of an overview of, of myself and also our school, Nord Moriata High School. But as I talk about innovation there's going to be two aspects. Innovation is, from my perspective, it can be in two parts or categorised into two parts, probably four, but the two main parts are evolutionary, so, and it's probably the sort of change making or change management that you're going through around innovation, that it's actually looking at and aligning to your school vision. Whoops, it's, it can be quite small, it's inward as well, um, and it's looking at school and continuous improvement. Then you've got the revolutionary, the rapid change, the change that is all about an overhaul, and, um, and it's often done in a short time. As a school, we have done both, and we're going through the revolutionary change. I, from my experience, the evolutionary change that we all are, or, or innovation that we're all experiencing, is probably easier to bring people along, and uh, and I'll talk about that. But the revolutionary is something that we are finding particularly challenging, as we are preparing for so many changes next year that I'll explain as well. And I'm sure you all are, because there are many, many changes as we move forward. Um, also in terms of innovation, innovation can be sustainable and of course we all hope that it's sustainable but there is also a place for disruptive change and we like to actually think that at times our staff feel comfortable being uncomfortable and challenged. Not all of them feel like that but we have actually um, put in a lot of support structures within the school and across the school to make sure that we listen, that we respond and also that we engage them in the consultation and the change process. So as far as who I am, you've already heard a little bit about my, my most recent leadership. Um, I started teaching way back um, in the late 80s and when um, my first appoint, one of my first appointments, permanent positions, was actually in Wyala. And I happened to be in Wyala with Peter. And there were many, many people in Wyala, as you can see. I don't know if you can see Peter at the back, towards the back. But behind Peter is, is I'm going to do some name dropping because I'm sure you would know some people in this shot. Um, Michael Huggett in the back row, my husband Anthony Van Ryten. So I started my married life for the first seven years teaching in the same school as my husband. That's one of the challenges that I've overcome. Um, I have... Uh, Oh, and I'm still married after 30-something years. Um, Cassie Dixon, who's now um, a, um, a deputy principal, you can see right in the middle with the big mo that we, you know, which is uh, that's a Brendan Simmons. Um, up the right, uh, on the far right, we've got uh, Annette Ryan, and then at the front, Di Garwood and Paul Wilson, who of course have recently um, retired, and they were principals as well. I'm sure there are many other people there. I'm there. I haven't pointed myself out, but I'm there as well. The big hair. Um, they were great times. For us um, in the early 90s, it was all really, it was a wonderful stomping ground. It provided an opportunity for myself to be able to really experience a whole range of different leadership opportunities. I was teaching for six months and moved straight into a leadership role um, and uh, really focusing on equity. So my passion for equity and social justice and working with girls at risk was uh, just a fantastic opportunity. And I really believe that um, for one to develop what it's important for all of us as leaders to develop and have a repertoire of skills, a repertoire of opportunities that will actually shape us and make us who we are today. So when I talk to someone about timetabling, I've had some timetabling experience. When I talk, and I'm a maths teacher by the way, so I like to think logically. When I talk to someone about student wellbeing, I've had student wellbeing experiences uh, and so on. So I think being well-rounded, you don't have to um, know all of the answers, but it gives you an insight into what's actually happening across the school. So some of my experiences, oh sorry, I then moved on to Mitcham Girls High School. I was a vet and maths coordinator there for a number of years. Loved Mitcham. I know it's a fantastic place, but really developed my passion for um, gender equity. Already had that from the work that I was doing, but uh, of course Mitcham still is, but it certainly was in those days a lighthouse school. So I was able to work with um, reshaping the mathematics curriculum with uh, the SACE board, I can't even remember what they were called back then, but also the universities. So it's an exciting times. Um, and then also moving to Norwood Moriata High School, was vet coordinator for two years, back to Underdale for eight years where I started out as a vet coordinator, moved to um, student services or student wellbeing assistant principal, deputy of curriculum and the international baccalaureate and also acting principal. Then the challenge started as principal at Salisbury East High School. 
Both at Underdale and Salisbury East High School, we didn't have an international program, but there were opportunities. So we developed international programs focusing on um, how we can create opportunities for our local students to think outwardly and have outbound experiences. We felt it was really important. We were at Underdale culturally diverse, Salisbury East, not so much, but we wanted to have them to have those experiences. We also looked at the curriculum and we started doing some fantastic work in STEM. And these are the experiences that I brought to Norwood Moriata High School. And what I was just saying before, I think really fits with this quote. And that is, yeah, we might be leaders, but I, don't prefer, I, I wouldn't stand up and say, yes, I'm a leader. It's about who I am and also that all of the skills shape who I am and what I'm able to do. I'm also a learner and I learn every day. I, I must admit I don't read as much as I'd really like to, but I learn from my staff and especially my executive team, two of whom are here today. Um, so we're, it, we're, I'm very fortunate to have such a dynamic, supportive team. So as far as Norwood Moriata High School is concerned, I'm not going to go through, go through all of those points, but I think it's really important for you to understand the context of our school. We are the only dual campus secondary site in metropolitan Adelaide. We have been together as a dual campus for 29 years. Um, we have just under 1,500 students across the two campuses that are three kilometres apart. So there is a middle campus with about 850 students and a senior campus with about 650 students. So eight to 10 on one campus, 11 and 12s on another, along with a high, achieve, um, a high achieving year 10 group. Now, this brings a whole lot of complexity. We are a category six school. We often will say we, and, and from my experiences in lower, lower um, SES schools, this is a really complex school. And part of that complexity is having staff on two campuses, quite distinct cultures when you think about a middle school and a senior school, really different. And what our challenge now is how we're going to bring them together. And we've been working on that for a number of years. So I'll talk about that in just a moment. So that's the big revolutionary change. Also other things for you to know is that we do have, uh, we offer the International Baccalaureate Middle Years Program and have done for over 20 years. We have been recognised by the Council of International Schools as, as being a world class school, so we have that accreditation and have had that for um, almost 20 years as well. And so we can proudly say that we are a world class school. We have got the international accreditation. But it's more, as you know, than just the accreditation. It's what we do and it's the work that we do in our teaching and learning. So there are pockets of outstanding, brilliant practice that people will comment on. But there's a level of complacency as well because our students are pretty much compliant. Not all, but most of them are really compliant. So our work is about how do we stretch and lift those students as well. And I'm, I can see some of you nodding so that you know. And, and it's about perhaps for those teachers too, what we're already getting is high quality, you know, outstanding results. So why should we change? It's really important for us to talk all the time about why we're doing what we're doing and telling that compelling story. Um, lastly, uh, I just wanted to talk about our connections and how we've actually been able to build our connections both locally and globally has been not just simply doing it, but it's been supporting our existing programs and our new special interest programs. So community and um, local and global partnerships have made a significant difference for our students to be able to think outward. It's really important here in Australia for our students to have opportunities to recognise the diverse cultures, and by the way, we have over 80 different cultures in our school, but also to know one's identity, to know the identity of other people within their classroom, but also outside of the school, and to appreciate those identities and cultures. Now, where we're moving and how we're moving, this is what's going to happen next year. Not only, like all of you, are we going to have Year 7s, but at the end of this year we are co-locating and picking up all of the 29 years of resources on the middle campus and bringing them across to the senior campus where we will become one school. I hope it's going to be smooth. The, um, <laughs> we've done a lot of work for the last few years, but in particular this year, of course what this brings is excitement, but change fatigue. And I'm exhausted 
but I would never, and I'm only saying this to you in confidence, you know, to stand up in front of my staff and put on that facade that this is too hard, I would never do that. But there are so many challenges. So I would say that our executive team and a lot of our leaders walk around the school with masks on, um, you know, try to get the best ma um, makeup and, you know, that we possibly can to make sure that um, our staff are buoyed, buoyed by the, our confidence that this is, and reassurance that this is going to be fantastic. And it will be, but there's so much work to be done. Um, so we're actually going to grow from about 1470 to over 1750, possibly 1800 students next year on one site. We are building a school at the moment, it's a $54 million build, so we are a construction site. And I've had other people say, oh yes, but we are too. And then they come to our school and they oh my goodness, it absolutely is. Um, Rowan was there not long ago and, and uh, you know, other people have been there and it, it's, it really is a construction site. It's not going to be finished until December the 20th, with fingers crossed. Um, so lots and lots of changes are happening on our, on our site. But I'm not got here to talk about the build, but that brings added complexity and it's very much part of our picture and our story. And then also what we're really excited about is during lockdown we went through our verification visit for the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program so that we can continue our international curriculum work and have that seamless connection all the way through. So I'm very pleased to be able to stand up that last week we got our verification for the IBDP. So we're actually, thank you. So we are now one of the other four schools along with Glenunga International High School. Um, so there's, there's uh, five of us who are now going to be able to offer the IBDP from next year. But that adds other challenges and we've had to work with our staff on making sure that they are trained and also prepared to be able to deliver the IBDP next year. And then lastly, our continued work to strengthen global initiatives, in particular in the, in the light of now we can some of these other priorities will no longer be driving and all of our attention. Very mindful of the time. So, our work and my work in particular, and I'm not going to play this video, but hopefully you'll get this slideshow and you can see this three minute video from Simon Breakspear, where he talks about how to actually, uh, about change management and innovation. And the cycle of clarify, incubate, and amplify. I'm sure you've all heard of this before, and he's spoken at leaders' conferences and so on. But for us, what we're actually going through, and I wanted to phrase, use his analogy with all of, and I'm not going to play it, with all of the, excuse my global uh, mistake, that was just there for anyone to pick up. So, um, the what we are doing is these are all of the things that are happening in our school that support developing global learners. But for each one of them, then they're, they're not in silos, they're all connected. And so we've got committees, we've got uh, a range of different teams that are all supporting and driving this work. But from Simon Breakspear's work about um, clarifying, it's clarifying what that vision is, articulating that vision and then start and drilling down. There are so many other priorities and, and things that we want to do, but making sure that we are very succinct in where we're going. And so, and then, what I like to think of it as a spiral, so starting small, then starting to spiral out, and thinking about how we've got a prototype and bringing in your champions, so, so we always look for volunteers or different teams to actually drive that work. They will do the prototyping, sharing, communicating, and then it gets bigger and bigger and amplifying and involving more and more staff, and it becomes a momentum. And so we've actually done that with a whole lot of things at the same time. I can't do that. I can't do it all. So, of course, my role is, and this has been one of the hardest things as a leader, and especially someone like me, is to be able to step back and allow others to take control and to lead and trust them, but monitor and mentor and support them alongside. So that is my work, and my work is about them coming back to me and troubleshooting and letting me know where things are at. Obviously, I'm involved in a whole lot of these working parties and initiatives, but particularly from getting it started and then stepping in and monitoring where things are at. Um, but for your work, um, I'm sure that that's how you operate in some of your smaller teams when you're leading, but also uh, it's really important from my perspective that the monitoring and making sure that that change is continuing in a positive direction, or for us to actually be able to stop, reflect and change course. So some of the things that we've gone and done, and I've tried to categorise all of these different initiatives into three categories. First of all, from a global capabilities perspective and how we're developing capabilities in our young people. This is obviously teaching and learning. So 
um, through the International Baccalaureate, it is a requirement that all teachers teach international perspectives and intercultural perspectives. So when you're teaching mathematics, aligning that to other cultures. And they will actually have um, similar work to what um, Lee want, want to be Crockett talks about you know the big question and then going through in solutions fluency and the six D's and and uh, defining and dreaming and unpacking and so on. And um, this is the sort of work that we do in all of our classes with our unit planners. We also have got five languages that helps drive developing um, cultural understanding. But we also celebrate. And we have cultural days and we have um, they call it the five F, the five F's. I never th can think of all fives, but food, fashion, flags, and festivities, and whatever the five is. These are all really important, that, but that's the tip of the iceberg. It's about attitudes below the surface, and what we are doing, and challenging, and asking questions, and making our, our young people think about their own identity, and how they interact with other cultures, is part of what we do through these international and intercultural perspectives in the classroom. So that's across all learning areas. Then we've also spent time looking at entrepreneurial work. Um, but most importantly, I think one of the biggest driving factors has been our work around challenge-based learning. So challenge-based learning for us is problem-based, project-based, inquiry-based, whatever you like. We, uh, an interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary learning, we are really interested in all of that. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to define and conceptualise the future-focused pedagogies for Norwood Moriata High School. So we've called it CBL, or challenge-based learning. And we were really strongly influenced by Sir Ken Robbins, uh, it's a High Tech High, first of all, in 20, so we started this work in 2016. So High Tech High, we couldn't get High Tech High to come to us, so we got the best next thing, and that's Jake Plaskett. Jake works in New South Wales now and drives a lot of the work, sorry, no, uh, Victoria. So their STEM work. Um, he was so inspirational and he was a graduate and a teacher at High Tech High. We also worked with Lee Wantaby Crockett um, across our partnership and of course Yong Zhao. And then you've also got Sir Ken Robinson, um, bless him, you know, for some of the work that he actually did to help shape our thinking. And we had, we had STEM work and Chris is our director of STEM and he, he and I developed a STEM program with a team. We've got... Um, we have specialist programs around STEM as well, but the STEM thinking was something that we started off with first of all. Then what we had in our school is that we felt that STEM approaches were supporting the development of global competencies, and this is why we really focused on STEM. But then we had other teachers say, well, what about English? What about humanities? It can't always be about STEM, hence how we've moved to challenge-based learning, that every learning area is really important to share authentic interdisciplinary learning experiences where students are actually experiencing inquiry. And we're very lucky that through the International Baccalaureate Middle Years Program, it is an expectation that our teachers deliver interdisciplinary learning and there's a structure as well. So we had the framework there and we've been able to harness that. Um, also, what we've been able to do over the last six years, is we've, we've been able to strengthen our sister school relationships. We used to be the largest international school, school with the international students in, in South Australia, and one of the largest in the country, with 170 international students. We now have 65. We'll be going to 40, because we have a capacity management plan and we cannot keep up with the demand. It's fantastic. It's a great problem to have. The local community is now shifting to Norwood Moriata High School, but sadly, and due to COVID, but also our international demand, we can't keep up with and we've had to reduce. But as a result of all the fantastic work, so I, can't, you know, I encourage you, if you haven't got international students in your school, they enrich your school community so much through their experiences and we, have a, and we continue to have an amazing foundation. Happy for people to come and talk to us about that. Um, to be able to support our international students that has actually developed to support all of our students across our school. But what I wanted to say is through our international connections, we have sister schools for five of our languages plus others. We've got about nine sister schools. Our students have outbound experiences, but of course we have many inbound experiences and, and study tours. Through COVID, we've actually um, shifted that to virtual study tours, cross cultural collaborations with other, um, with other schools in other countries. For example, our STEM classes have been working with schools in Japan. 
um, all through virtual connections. We also are running um, the first suite of Connect programs for international education services where we run the SACE and there are three, uh, four schools now that deliver this, the SACE and, and ISEC programs to students who are still onshore. So they're offshore for us, but they're still at home and they are engaging with our teachers. So we, you know, I had staffing linked to this. I had to actually look at ways that we were still having our teachers teaching international students who weren't in our school. So fortunately, we had an opportunity to be able to lead this work around the Connect program for overseas. You can see other things that we've gone and done. It's really important through this work in developing global competencies where our students have been able to um, engage in student agency and have a strong voice and social, and social impact is one thing that we have found has been just remarkable. Plan for the Planet, and Darman was actually involved in Plan for the Planet when she was at the school, um, was a two year program, we're now at Leeds School and it was just remarkable where our young people developed a program for um, around the environment. They presented it in Canberra to the Minister. They've also presented it to the Premier and they went to Mauritius to present it to um, young people around the world. We've had um, also a global summit, which is what I'm going to talk to you about in a moment, which is probably the most significant event that we have actually had in our school that has showcased our school on a global stage, but also allowed our whole community to be outward thinking and to embrace those global competencies and to develop an appreciation for different cultures, but also understand how important it is to actually be able to think big and not narrow. So, and you can see lots of partners. We've really focused on developing our partnerships as well. So I've mentioned Yong Zhao. We started working with Yong Zhao in about 2017. You can see a very young Jason Shutt in the background there. Um, and Yong has actually really inspired us. He talks a lot about global learning and global education, but for me the most profound thing he says is that if you really want to engage young people, but also to ensure that we are, uh, that, that we've got to embrace humanity. We've got to actually make, make sure that our young people have opportunities to create value for others. Then they will actually develop passion. They will be inspired, and they will also inspire others. So we took that from a perspective of student agency, but also uh, about enabling our students to actually work with other people to really be able to make a difference. And we felt that that once again fitted and aligned with our vision and our values and our motto. So our work with Yong um, was really inspirational through Saspers Transforming Schools, and then working with him as a thinker in residence. So this is a video of our global summit. but there's no sound. So whilst that's actually going through, We actually had 65 students from around the world, um, from 13 different, country, uh, 13 different schools, 10 countries, come to Norwood Moriata High School for one week. Our community hosted them free of charge, for, so they were all homestayed, 20 teachers. So th this, this is the week program, starting off with an amazing opening ceremony. We had social entrepreneurs come in and workshop with the students. But all of, and everything that we did was framed by Lee Want Wantabee's um, Crockett's work, the Solution Fluency work. And it was very much aligned to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, where young people came together to come up with solutions. And there were students working, so we had 60 of our own students working with the 65 students from around the world in small groups, intercultural groups, coming up with solutions and then presenting their solutions at the end of the week. Some of that work has continued as well beyond the, this week. They had cultural programs as well as you can see. It was the most amazing event I have ever been involved in. And this is something that we're looking to replicate both face to face and virtually next year. Because we've, 
We're doing it. We're in a tri partnership to do it every three years. But of course, COVID's actually put a dampener on it. So our students have been involved in other global summits um, with other partners around the world in a virtual sense. And Yong has also assisted us in that process. So our students were actually doing um, a Sound of Music at, the, at that time. So they were singing So Long Farewell as part of the closing ceremony. It was, as I said, absolutely remarkable. In terms of all of the work that we've gone and done around global competencies and developing our students as global learners with all of these different programs, the outcomes have been extensive. They range from academic achievement, so we always, always had really strong results, but we have seen a, a significant increase in the A-band. We've seen um, improvement in some relationships. We've still got that to go in terms of our relationships with our teachers, but we have seen some improvement and connection and pride. Our staff and our students, as a result of that program and all of the other things that we've done, um, were so engaged and wanting, and I can see Darman nodding, she was part of that. that it, was, it was the most amazing experience um, that we continue to try to emulate. But the, the polishness, the professionalism of that week has actually transpired into everything that we do and it's become an expectation of how we as a school operate and how we showcase publicly as well and how our students represent um, our school both on the local and international stage. But you can see a range of different connections. For me personally, it was really important to develop further collaborations with international schools. So we have so many other partners as well as a result. And these partnerships, the global partnerships, have allowed our staff to actually, it's particularly through language, but also now it's beyond language, to be able to connect with our sister schools and our partner schools, and our students to be able to also go um, outside to other countries. This is one of our stu a group of students. Um, I actually took them to Japan with some other staff as well, and then when they went to a global summit. So there are summits around the world, amazing opportunities. Our students also, as I said, they do have other outbound experiences. What I wanted to talk to you about is some of the tips in terms of leadership and how we've actually been able to do all of this transformation. As I said, it's evolutionary. There's lots and lots of different things that we've gone and done. And I talked to my, my team about the lone nut. And I said, have you seen the video? So apologies if you haven't have seen this video. It's very old, but I think it gives a great view of leadership. And when you are a leader, it's not necessarily about you as the leader, it's about your team that follow. And Fullen talks about it's being the change agents, you know, the, the, the followers are the change makers and what they actually bring to the table as well. And, and our work is to influence and to harness and create opportunities for them as well. But to be brave. So hopefully this will work.
lesson here. Did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy and building all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. I first saw that probably about 15 years ago and I thought, oh, it's not very good quality then. I think, uh, but there's nothing like it out there, so maybe we all need to start a movement and actually try to redo this video properly. Um, Jason, you can be the, the shirtless dancer at <laughs> first one. Um, oh, that sounds inappropriate, sorry. <laughs> Um, some other of my leadership tips for you, and I'm sure that these aren't rocket science, but for me in my journey, it's, um, and before I even go into it, is that we've had so many things happen, and sometimes people feel that it's, um, when you do it, it's a bit like literacy, we're working on literacy, oh, we've done literacy, we don't need to do it anymore. It's, uh, and, and sometimes we feel like that. We're actually going through that with challenge-based learning. We spent so much time on challenge-based learning. We talked about it through all of our STEM work. We had, we spent PLC time. We've had uh, presentations and then we've used that for differentiation. But because we've moved on to other priorities in our PLC work, because we have PLCs every Wednesday afternoon, it's, it's almost like that's not important anymore for some of our staff. So we have to keep going back as leaders and reminding everybody of and telling those compelling stories about what is important. And remember, we've done this, and this is what it looks like, and this is what the, the outcomes were. So keep reminding people so we can maintain the movement and we can maintain the momentum. For me, I think that's the greatest challenge with so many things that are happening. The other thing that I, I probably want to talk about is, I think in terms of innovation and for our work, is, that, is, is actually about asking those provocative questions. Um, I'm probably known for going up to people and asking them a question or making a statement and then walking away. And then sometimes some of the staff will actually have a reaction and they might come and talk to me about it or they will go to one of the other leaders and say, Jackie said this, what does this mean? And it actually starts, maybe it's not the right way to do it, but we're actually getting some really interesting traction from it. But I think having that open dialogue and that pedagogical debate as well, but are starting off with provocative questions and, and talking to people, open up the gates for creativity and different ideas. I also feel that for anyone new to starting a project, it's about very much about looking at what your passion is and what your expertise is. For me, coming into Norwood Moriarty High School, I had experience with international. I was passionate about that. I'm a maths teacher, I've all, and as a female um, senior maths teacher, I was always passionate about STEM and bringing and increasing young women in um, the areas of maths and science. So that was naturally something that I wanted to work on, and I saw opportunities, and I had people who could actually follow and then take the lead with support, of course, as the, as the video showed. Um, and finally, I think it's really important for all leaders to get involved beyond school. So don't just think what you're doing in your... Look, what you're doing in your school is important and connecting with the people within your school, but get involved in your community. Rotary clubs, um, different industry and organisations, bring them in. You'd be surprised how industry and other partners um, what, that they will say yes. I think too often we think that they won't come into schools. They're just waiting for the opportunities and they want to actually give back. There is a sense of, of community out there and willingness to be able to work with schools. And we've had great success with a number of our different partners. And we have many, but we've got probably Boeing and Microsoft and um, Illumination are one of the, last, the largest ones. But they give a lot. Uh, not only time, but also in resources. We've also found that um, we started this off by reaching out with a breakfast, a business breakfast, inviting people in and old scholars in. So use all of your networks. The other thing I'd like to also say is Beacon Foundation is a great resource for schools that are um, and lower SOE, um, SES school, schools. At Salisbury East, I was involved in Beacon Foundation. Beacon are an organisation that work with schools to um, increase op um, opportunities for young people through and pathways for young people. So it was all about employment opportunities, creating um, 
uh, collaborative classrooms where industry would co-design with, um, with teachers and, and deliver authentic learning experiences. So I've taken that and we've been able to shape that into our challenge-based learning work. So please, there are a lot of organisations out there who can help you, but it's certainly the global perspective has been something that has probably been one of the greatest opportunities for myself, the travel, being able to go around the world and present as well and um, create new experiences for South Australian education. So we've, I've done a lot of public speaking overseas. And then moving on to the transformation, I won't have time to go through all of it, but this is our work that we're doing right at the moment. Um, about 18 months ago, we had a transformation action group. And this group did a lot of evidence, and we'd already started working with our staff around reimagination of Norwood Moriata High School. We only knew just under two years ago that we were going to be moving onto the one site. And then we thought, right, this is an opportunity for us to reshape our school, change things, do the big overhaul. And a two-year time frame, well, actually, it's less than two years, is huge to be able to do it. So we set up a team, we visited schools, um, we did a lot of um, virtual work, we did a lot of evidence-based research, we shared all of that with our staff, we had recommendations, and our community voted, and we came up with the work that we wanted to do. We had an amazing list, but as things started going through, we had to actually start to reflect and think, really, is that a priority right now? And workshop that with our staff and change direction, not too much. The course of where and the vision of where we're going is still there and we're still working towards that. And we worked on what that vision would be with our staff and our community and they're very happy with that. But probably some of the things that we, what we wanted to do in terms of teaching and learning and our programs and organisational structures aren't happening. Um, and so, and I'll just talk about those next steps, but, but first of all, these are all of the things that we've had to contend with over the last two years. It's not only for me as a leader, it's about looking at the teaching and learning, what does that look like, and getting the buy-in from all staff. We thought we had it. We thought we had it with the timetable. And then we had union meetings, we had other meetings, there were whispers, um, comments were indirectly coming back to PAC and also to the executive team. And we thought, right, let's be proactive, let's call a meeting and just focus on the timetable. That was the best thing we ever did, even though we had lots and lots of other consultation opportunities over the last year. Because our timetable is changing to an 8-6 line structure and focusing on large gr um, groups of teachers doing a lot of team teaching. Big change for our teachers, and yet we've done a lot of professional development to support them in that space. And I know there's still work to be done. Um, we're just going through a rebranding. So hot off the press, I've just spoken to the minister yesterday, we will be renaming our school. It will be announced in the, uh, probably the next two to four weeks. Um, and so with that is a whole lot of signage and other things, you know. We're going all in, we may as well do the school name as well. And, and that's probably very much how I, I operate, but I've got to make sure I've got the community with me. So everything that we've been doing around all of the changes and transformation, you know, from timetable to scheduling to new teachers to all the policies have to be changed as well. You, you know, we had mobile phone policy for middle school, not for the senior school. We've had different behaviour management structures. Everything we had different on our two campuses, we've had to review we are reviewing and make sure that they're ready by the end of the year and people are inducted and informed and first of all consulted as part of that process. So it's a, we're finding time is defeating us at the moment but we're still very positive that we're going to get there. And of course the IBDP work has been something that we've been focusing on this year. So as far as challenges and tips, I think it is about being courageous. Take a stand, be courageous, go for what you want. Don't deviate from it in terms of that final goal. Your route might change, but do that in collaboration with others. I think it's also really important to, you know, communication, communication, communication. Making sure that you're talking to staff, you're emailing staff, whether it be at staff meetings. But my governing council and my community have also had to be involved. And we've actually taken the approach because of COVID to do more virtually. So we have virtual meetings across the two campuses so that we, and we've got more staff meetings. So unlike a mainstream school um, on a one campus, we have middle and senior campus meetings. We've had to have more whole staff meetings and do it virtually. Parking, I can only park 20 out of 130 staff on the school at the moment. 
That's an issue. Traffic management is something what, that I've been having to deal with and has been a challenge. And working with the Burnside Council has been quite interesting. Um, but uh, this year, <laughs> speaking of councils, navigating the political landscape has been a huge learning curve for me. I think it's always, or it always is part of principal's work. But that for me, um, the last two years, and working with Peter, um, Rick Purse, uh, you name it, I have been fighting for my school and going for money and support and all of the things that we need. And, I ha and trying to navigate that through the system and through politics has been particularly challenging and knowing where to go and who to ask and, and, the, well, sorry, and the support that you need to get. Um, I think it's also really important, and you've all heard about the implementation dip. Apologies for the German. Because I'm a German teacher, I didn't even realise it was German until this morning. Um, it's really important that when you start doing things, there is, like challenge-based learning, we're getting a lot of traction, then you have that dip. And so don't lose sight. The staff think, oh, we've done it. No, keep working, pull the teams together and keep focusing on it. And I think for us, because there are so many things that are happening, we know we've dropped the ball with some things. And so who can pick it up? And making sure you've got that capacity elsewhere or be able to coach and mentor others to be able to pick it up is important. And, um, and so the people, the people part is our work, but it's also for us at this, this stage the most challenging. Um, and staff wellbeing. We have got a range of different mechanisms in our school to be able to monitor staff wellbeing. And through this revolutionary phase, that has been the hardest piece. Our staff understand completely where we're going, but there are so many pieces that, they, that we don't know yet. You know, we all want to know. We want to know what it will look like. We want to know where our office will be and who's going to be in our office and what we're going to teach. Well, they don't know that yet. They don't and they won't know that yet because we're actually, all offices are open. We're going to be a new school. This is a new beginning. No one is going to be in the same place so that we've got consistency because we have an us and them mentality at Norwood Moriata High School, being really honest. At times, yeah, we're one school, but we do have distinct cultures. So our work is we're trying to shape it, shake it up so that when everyone starts next year, we are one school. Um, so the senior school staff will not be in their offices, for example. It might sound insignificant, but it's really important in terms of shaping and shifting culture and what that will look like for next year. Um, it's also about where and how people are teaching. So our senior staff want to hold on to the senior classes. No, they'll be teaching middle school. Some of them haven't done that in 30 years and the other way around. So there's a fun and games. So you can see this is just the first piece of our puzzle. Um, but probably the last thing is that it's really important to obviously be able to, as I said, hold that line and fight the fight. Show your passion, show your commitment, be passionate and enthusiastic, tell those compelling stories at every chance that you can. And I'll just leave you with this wonderful piece. I, it's not about positional power, you know, I love that. It's, that's not how we operate. But I do believe that by being soft and supportive and gentle, you can show such amazing strength. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>